Ladies and gentlemen, this podcast, truly one of the most unusual ever recorded, contains dribble, slang, and frank discussion of subject matter which under no circumstances should be heard by small children, persons with a heart condition, or anyone who is upset easily. If you are such a person, or if you are the parent of a very small child in the room, we urge you to switch off your streaming device now. Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. Well, I'm totally ready to go. I can't wait to hear how this unfolds. So we are going to jump back to after the police found Dennis's mother's car and the suicide note. May 14th, 1986, eight days after Julie's death, a warrant was issued charging Dennis Neal Bullock with first degree murder meaning premeditated murder. Good. Conviction carried the automatic death penalty or life in prison without parole. Dennis was placed on the 10 most wanted fugitive list of St. Louis County Police with his litany of aliases. John Mason, David Bender, David Johnson, David Mason, John Masterson, you name it, he wow. called himself that. The U.S. Attorney of Eastern Missouri charged Dennis under federal fugitive warrants with fleeing the state as a murder suspect. That brought the FBI. Dennis's ex-wife, Anne, was not only shocked with the murder, mm-hmm. but she was angry because six months after their divorce, Dennis was using their joint account credit card. He had charged $300 at a Payless Cashway in Columbia, Missouri. Mm-hmm. That's midway in between St. Louis and Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Big college town. Big college Missouri. town. And this was right after he had left. So she brought the credit card statement to the police. Lieutenant Neer noticed that the date on the charge slip coincided with the rape of a school teacher there. No way. And from the school teacher's description, he thought her attacker just might be Dennis. But the young woman had not gone to a doctor immediately after her assault. So there was no physical evidence, such as semen or hair, or, you know. Mm. Near planned to drive halfway across the state to interview the rape victim. But just before he left, the Columbia police called to report that the woman had been so traumatized that she left town. No. With no known address. Really? Mm. Dennis's parents couldn't bear what was happening to their only surviving child. Couldn't believe that he was being charged for murder of his wife. And I bet they his thought second he was wife. Innocent, right? They believed mm-hmm. he was innocent and also that he had killed himself. The police didn't quite know what Dennis's parents knew. So they got their phone records. Phone records show that they called St. Paul looking for their son when he disappeared on May 8th. Also phoned the family where Dennis had fled in 1979 when his sister Cindy died, supposedly. Not supposedly she died. She did die. Supposedly fled to the Ozarks. They also spoke with Dennis's girlfriend, Jody, in D.C. on May 10th, the day of Julie's funeral, telling her he had disappeared and his wife was dead. Jody, of course, assumed that the wife was Anne. On May 13th, Dennis called Jody's parents at home late in the evening. Her sister answered. Dennis said he was John Masterson of Price Waterhouse, and he had dated Jody under the name of John Mason. While he was in Washington, D.C. And I'm trying to find her now, Dennis added. Well, sister was a little scared because she knew what was going on. Oh, she called the police here in St. Louis, and the St. Louis police contacted the FBI. The next day, May 14th, Dennis called Jody in her Washington, D.C. office. Dennis was upset, but still rational. He said he was having blackout spells, and he kept repeating, I didn't do it. I've been set up. I can't come back home until I can find out who did it. Jody kept asking where he was. And Dennis is like, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. But 
I just need to get out of the country. What kind of extradition agreement does the U.S. have with Canada? Another time when he called her at home, he asked her if she could contact an old friend of his to see if he could find him a new ID. Usually, Dennis kept their conversations short, and he called Jody a lot. In fact, so short that he would have little notes about the conversation, what he wanted to say. So he would hurry up. He would He's chat them like... off as he goes so he could hang up. But also, he was still planning to marry Jody, hmm. even while he was on the run. Mm -hmm. He promised her he would always be open and honest with her. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, he'd tell her he'd never slept with Julie at all. Mm -mm. Never slept with Julie. Well, the good part is, is if they get married and she goes with them, then that's their honeymoon, too. Exactly. And she would have that where the wife can't talk on the stand. Marital I, privilege. Yeah. Also, since Dennis was calling Jody so much, they just, FBI put a tracer on her phone. Good. Well, she called the police, right? Yeah, she called okay. the police to tell him that he had been calling her. Because she's smart. She's a hero. Thank you, Jody. So, Jody was so scared of Dennis that she moved out of her place. Yeah, good. And she moved in with a friend. Dennis had a set of her house keys, so mm -hmm. she did a good thing. When Dennis went on the lam, he dyed his hair, eyebrows, and beard a dark brown. And then he headed to California. There, he befriended a woman named Rose. Now, mm -hmm. she was a free spirit kind of gal. Little hippie girl. Kind of an aging surfer type girl. Mm -hmm. She slept in her tent during the day along the California coast. Yeah, and be hippie. <laughs> yeah. And then she worked the graveyard shift as a waitress in chain restaurants during the evening, overnights. He told her his name was Jonathan Dennis, but his friends just called him Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but that's He's funny. good. <laughs> He's good. He's good at remembering them names. And you know what? He was needing a campsite, too. He said he had been hitchhiking, but... Rose ain't no dummy. She noticed that the bus had just dropped him off at the campground. <laughs> well, he had to hitchhike from the bus to mm -hmm. her. And the only food he had in his 90-pound backpack was canned tuna. And he didn't have a can opener. <laughs> she just knew he was kind of lying. So Rose and Dennis shared a campsite. He would pay for the expenses and then sleep in her tent during the night while she was working. And then... He would leave and she mm -hmm. would sleep during the day. Okay. Dennis or Jonathan, as he is now. Jonathan Dennis, but you can just call me Dennis. Just Dennis. He told Rose that he had came to California after a rough divorce. That yeah. Okay. That, yeah. That's really not a lie. No. Mm -mm. Things are rough. Mm hmm He had caught his wife cheating. Oh. Twice. Oh. First time she'd come home reeking of sex. Ugh. He yes. said he'd wanted to strangle her. But he forgave her. The second time, he caught her with her lover. He said he felt so stupid because I put all of my property in joint names. <laughs> now I really want to kill buddy. my ex-wife. Oh, unbelievable. Dennis also discussed sexual bondage. And when he asked Rose what she thought about it, she just said, it's sick. Then Rose saw that he had a roll of tape and rope in his mm. backpack. And she said, uh, why do you need that, Jonathan? Because mm -mm. she always called him Jonathan. <laughs> he smiled creepily and he said, you never know when you may need things like this. Yep, that's creepy. Rose thought Dennis was trying to intimidate her. But she wasn't worried at all because she thought Jonathan was a pussy. <laughs> her words. I, I love Rose. <laughs> I, I think I want to be Rose's friend. Oh, she must be a tough cookie. To sleep in a tent? In California? Even if it's during the day, it's still creepy. It's loud. It has to be loud. By June 20th, Rose was sick of Dennis slash Jonathan. <laughs> he was drinking Jack Daniels all the time, getting drunk and acting crazy. Mm -hmm. And Stress. he was completely always reading newspapers, and he had bought a TV that he was constantly oh, watching. Oh. oh, okay. She kicked him out. She made him leave. Good. That'd scare me, though. I'd be afraid. Yeah. It's not like he doesn't know where you live. No. The security yeah, but, of a tent's not too great, I'm going to say. No, but I think, I don't think he was that interested in her. Yeah. But whatever. On July 3rd, Dennis called Jody again in D.C. This time he said he was running out of money. Jody said, okay, just give me your number and I'll call you back. And he fell for that. Mm -hmm. I hope. Yep. Yay. She did call him back, oh. but after calling the FBI and 
letting them know so they could trace the call. Mm -hmm. On July 4th, 1986, a Santa Cruz police officer got a call over his radio that he was to go to the corner of Ocean Street and Sokol. Subject is on phone in an outdoor booth. He's wanted by the FBI for homicide out of St. Louis. Within minutes, Dennis was under arrest. Yay, boy. So while Dennis was in California, the police put together how they thought Dennis had murdered Julie. This is what I want to hear. A house painter by the name of Gary had come forward after seeing Dennis's picture in the news. And Gary had picked up a hitchhiker looking like Dennis on May 6th at 5.15 a.m., about a mile and a half from Julie's house. And that's her murder date, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Scary. Gary told the police, you know, I normally don't pick up hitchhikers, but I had a feeling that this one desperately needed a ride. And because even though it was really chilly outside, he was sweating profusely. Mm. Huge beads of perspiration were just running down both sides of his head. And another thing to prove everybody knows everybody in St. Louis, Gary had painted Dennis's attorney's house. No way. Yeah. So he could pick out Dennis from a lineup. They didn't have to meet because they had met. So on May 13th, a police officer went down to a ticket agent at St. Louis Lambert Airport, laid three photos of Dennis on the counter, and asked the agent if he had ever seen this man before. Wow. And the ticket agent said, yeah. On May 6th, there was a nervous man, disheveled with wet, matted hair and sweating, had come at about 6.30 in the morning, that that morning, asking if Northwest Airlines had any seats left on its next flight to Minneapolis. No. Mm -hmm. The agent sold a one-way ticket to the man that paid cash with no luggage and called himself David Johnson. I wonder if those tickets are flagged today. Like if somebody buys a one-way ticket and they show up with no luggage, if that's like I don't know, you would think, well, it might with TSA and all that kind of stuff. It might be. So when the agent was brought in for a lineup, he also picked out Dennis. So remember the call that Dennis made to his boss? The, hey, can you cover for me? Yeah. Yeah. Dennis made that call from the Lambert Airport also. No. Investigators called Bell's security department and had them check the payphone lines by the gates where Dennis slash David Johnson's plane had been taking off that terminal. Mm -hmm. I know maybe people don't know what payphones are anymore, so they really don't know how you traced payphones. I have no idea. I thought you had to have something on there. No. Every payphone had a magnetic tape that records the times and the numbers of all the calls. Wow. Along with whether the caller or an operator dialed the number. And the tapes are permanently stored at Southwestern Bell. I learned something new. I don't know if they're at Southwestern Bell any longer since Mm -hmm. there is no Southwestern Bell. It's AT&T. So the computer printout showed an operator assistant call made at 6.49 a.m. May 6th to the Holiday Inn where Jim and Dennis were staying in St. Paul. So that was the call to his boss. And it matched the time that his boss had told the police. So here's what, from Jim's statement and what the police found out, this is what they thought happened. So on May 5th, 6.14, Dennis calls Julie. 7.20 p.m., Dennis signs out of a nearby building. 7.30, Dennis is last seen by Jim walking near the Holiday Inn. 7.50 p.m., flight departs St. Paul. By 10.11, it arrives at St. Louis Lambert Airport. That was the last official flight to St. Louis that night or just the last flight to St. Louis that night. May 6, 4 a.m., neighbor near Julie's house. There's an argument and a woman screaming. 5, 10 a.m., dispatcher receives a fire call from Julie's neighbor. 5, 15 a.m., Gary picks up Dennis hitchhiking. 6, 30 a.m., Dennis buys a plane ticket from Lambert to St. Paul. 6, 45, Jim received a long-distance call from Lambert where Dennis asks him to cover for him. 7 a.m., plane departs Lambert. 8.25, plane arrives in Minneapolis, and then you know the rest. At 9.15, Jim finds Dennis in the shower. So somebody had mentioned to the police that there had been a rumor that Dennis had been briefly married while he was in college. Hmm. And police at that point had never really tracked it down, so they just began to think it was a rumor. 
when an anonymous woman in Georgia called saying that she had been married to Dennis and he was the father of her several children. She said she didn't see much of him, what with all his traveling and all. But she had met him through a correspondence course when he was in Georgia. The woman never gave her name and never called back. And plus, the police could never match any records. There were also no records of Dennis being married in Georgia. So he probably, they probably didn't look under any kind of John name. Mm -hmm. Well, or he used an alias. Right. But, you know, he liked those John and Jonathans. (laughs) Police also were trying to link Dennis to two other bondage murders, one in Wyoming and one in Wisconsin. Both occurred while Dennis had been in those areas. Both women were found dead and burnt and strapped to chairs. No way. Mm -hmm. Anne, in the meantime, had gotten Dennis's diaries out of a safety deposit box. You know, remember he was keeping them there. Mm -hmm. She read them and she was horrified. Because in them, he had ramblings on how to kill somebody and not get caught. She gave it to the police. So when Dennis was arrested in California, all he had in his wallet was a $50 gift card to Saks Fifth Avenue. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. And a ticket to one of those uh, one-hour photo mats where you can drop Uh off. Mm Uh-oh. So the officers went to get the pictures. And when they were opening the envelope, they were sure that it was going to be kinky sex yeah. type, some kind of murders. sexual. Yeah. yeah. Nope. Instead, they found that Dennis had photographed Julie's silver, her china, the furniture, paintings, anything that was worth money in the house. Before, he dropped it off when he left for uh, mm-hmm. St. Paul. The day before the fire, that's when he dropped it off on he, his way to the airport, pretty much. He took pictures of Julie's stuff, I guess, and it would be his, It was too. his, mm-hmm. For insurance reasons, I'm Right, guessing. in case the house caught on fire or anything like that. Wow. So the prosecution hypothesized that while Dennis was in St. Paul, he called his wife in an outrage because she had transferred $64,000 out of their joint bank account. Which is really her money. It was her money. They thought that she argued with him while they were on the phone, and he was upset that He was losing control, so he flew home in a rage, and as he was tying her up with more than 76 shards of tape, he was shrieking, F you, F you. I don't know how they thought that he was saying that, but maybe that, I don't know. But they needed to know if Julie and Dennis had ever tried bondage before. So the biggest problem the prosecution had about finding witnesses to testify against Dennis, that half of them don't want to be embarrassed Mm -hmm. that they knew him. The socialites and stuff. And the others were afraid that he'd come after them. Yeah. So of the St. Louis elite, Mm -hmm. only one man was willing to cooperate. Really? The other members of the group had to be subpoenaed, and they were considered hostile witnesses. Mm -hmm. Not because they thought he was innocent or felt any loyalty to him, but they were embarrassed and felt betrayed. Yeah. They let him into the group, and he they're the untouchables, you know? Not to be mean, but they... No, I know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, because they're well-known, too. So then your name's going to be right next to this murderer who... Right. In the book that I read on this that I'll discuss later, Nina said that we all know everyone in St. Louis except those past a certain point because of their Mm -hmm. wealth. There's only one socialite that they couldn't get to, the Becky... Cabot, who I believe is some relation of Anheuser-Busch, mm-hmm. once they found out that Dennis was wanted for murder, mm-hmm. they flew her out of the country. But if it is the Bush family, I don't know. It's just my uneducated guess that I spent hours on the Google trying to find. Mm-hmm. Fly that problem All out. over the world, she was flown. Wow. The elite were promised by the prosecution that when they testified, they wouldn't have to be asked their names or their occupations. You know, when you go up to the stand, Mm -hmm. state your name, state your occupation. And that's almost unheard of. Actually, the only time, I believe, is when you're under the witness protection program. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only time you don't have to say who you are. Mm -hmm. Everybody was okay with that. But when they got on the stand later, the defense attorney not only called the one man by his name name (laughs) during the question, but he also asked how you pronounce his first name. 
and then repeated the whole name. Like, so how do you pronounce your first name? And what was his first name? Like Thomas? Well, in the book, it said Luke. So I don't know who he is. Couldn't find it because all of these the yeah, trials. I was, I were, was wondering if it was like right. something simple because that's kind of a conniving little. Well, and then he also, all the women socialites, he would use their first names when he questioned them. Oh, so wow. it was sly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and then about the sex life, the only people when they wanted to bring up that Julie did not practice bondage with Dennis or was not a vamp like Dennis portrayed her. Not that you're a vamp if you practice anything. No, no, I did. That's he how, did that. yeah, did that. this was the you, court. You're you're okay. Good. I didn't want to piss anybody off. Everybody, you live your own life. I'm happy. Do you, boo-boo. Exactly. So the only people that really knew that Julie talked about her sex life was the doctor and her friend Terry. Remember, she told Terry about Dennis hurting uh -huh, her. Uh -huh. Well, the doctor could be a witness. Mm -hmm. because murder victims don't have any privacy rights. So anything and everything that you've ever said in your entire life, if you die and you go on stand, it can be told. Oh. You oh, could lie about him. Yeah. Nobody would know because you're not there to protect yourself. Terry couldn't because what she would say would be hearsay. Also, Julie's diaries and any conversations with any other friends, all hearsay. And it's hearsay because Julie would not be there to be cross-examined. Mm -hmm. That the defendant sense. could not exercise his constitutional right to cross-examine his accuser. So they thought about, okay, let's ask Barbara. She's the one that was beaten up during oh, the Barbara. karate chop to the neck. Yes. That was tricky because even though the hitting her was a felony assault, Dennis was never charged. She never prosecuted she, yeah, him. She, she never went to the in. police mm -hmm. at all. So the prosecution met with Barbara. And he thought, okay. As soon as he did, he's like, yep, she's not going to be a witness. Because. <laughs> what would she do? As he was talking to her, Barbara explained what Dennis had done to her and said to her that all women, sex and violence went together. And when DePriest, who was the prosecutor, who's now a big judge, he asked her, you know, what do you think about that, Barbara? And she said, I agree with him. Oh. And also when she left, she said, hey, tell Dennis. If he gets off just to give me a call, I thought he was cute. Get out. No. Would you ever? Seriously. As you know, the defense gets to see every piece of evidence that the prosecution mm -hmm. has for court. And the prosecution had tons of evidence mm -hmm. or tons of boxes and stuff like that. So when the defense would ask for the physical evidence, one of the investigators would have to take it to this lock room where Dennis and the attorneys would be. Dennis got to see it, too? Dennis got to see it all this, too. Because, you know, he got his law degree, his jailhouse law degree. Of course he did. So he was helping work on his case, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the investigators that usually brought the evidence said that Dennis, the thing he was most interested in was uh, the sex manuals <laughs> and the colored photographs of his burnt wife. So Dennis had been in prison since he was brought home from California, and that was in July, about mm -hmm. July 9th, I believe. He also got to see all the evidence that was being used to convict him for murder. The courtroom psychiatrist didn't interview him until December 1986. Is that normal? No. So not. that gave Dennis five months to come up with what he said happened the night that Julie was murdered. So not only was he working on his jailhouse law degree, but he was also... Getting his story straight and researching what mm -hmm. he needed to say. Right. And do. Mm -hmm. Nice. Psychiatrist had said that Dennis lacked a solid identity, you know, being a narcissistic and psychopath, mm -hmm. that he found it easier to go through life taking on roles, preferably one with clear cut rules. Mm -hmm. So Dennis at this time, while in prison, became a model prisoner. He taught computer classes, and he put himself through mm -hmm. jailhouse law school, like I said. Jenny and Bob Bullock had hired Art Margulies, one of St. Louis's best criminal attorneys, and they hired him the night that he was brought back from California. Mm -hmm. Dennis's parents also paid for all of Dennis's legal fees. It's assumed that they did. Nobody he thinks... He didn't have any money. I mean, he used everybody else's money. He was cheap, too. So he um, had that gift card to Saks. He did. He could look nice. They borrowed from their retirement fund and they mortgaged their house. Even Dennis's beloved grandmother. Gram Gram. Did what she could to raise money. 
anything to keep Dennis from dying by the hands of the state. Jenny even quit her job at the store to spend more time with Dennis or on the case or maybe even just to manage Dennis's uh, financial portfolio that he asked her to. Mm -hmm. Who knows? When people saw how Dennis treated his parents, they were angry. He didn't like it. After all they did for him. Yeah, he was embarrassed by them. They were just hardworking, plain folks, said one woman, and he was ashamed by their lack of education and refinement. Dennis seemed resentful that his mother dominated the family. He wanted to do it, probably. But Bob and Jenny stood proudly by him every step of the way through his trial. So the state of Missouri versus Dennis Bullock started on May 26, 1987. That morning, Dennis's lawyer thought anything less than the death penalty will be a major victory. I would agree. Right before the trial started, prosecution and defense were in the judge's chambers arguing about whether a statement Julie's friend Terry had made to the police and also had repeated under oath during her deposition. Mm -hmm. Terry had said that Julie and her brother had had sex. Wait. Mm -hmm. Terry said that Julie had told her that Julie and Julie's brother had sex? Yes. Oh. A little incest. Now, the way Julie worded it was that they were very close and that they had sex. Terry had added she did not remember when or where this act allegedly took place. Or if Julie had been in, on any of her major antipsychotics. So. said. Not, not meaning it. Or maybe Julie actually meant that they had slept in the same bed together mm-hmm. as, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's not wrong. Just sleeping. Just sleeping, exactly. <laughs> Let's clarify that. But the judge ruled it inadmissible, thank God. So the opening statements began with the prosecution, and they emphasized how Dennis Bullock was a decadent, philandering, lying, social climbing sadist that coveted Julie Miller's estate. Dennis secretly and knowingly wed a mentally unstable woman for her money. And after 10 weeks, when he could no longer control her, he tied her up and watched her slowly suffocate. And Dennis had committed the perfect crime until he didn't behave like a grieving widower. The defense made it clear that Julie's personality and morals were on trial. Julie was sexually promiscuous and she had a deviant sexual fantasies and orchestrated the entire event that led to her death. As a result, she died accidentally. And then he said what would become Dennis's whole defense. It was all an accident, which later became the defense strategy for the preppy murderer. It was just an accident. It was just an accident. A little rough sex. A little, it was an accident. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to totally strangle her for five minutes. Or set her on fire. Exactly. It was in totally an accident. That she's taped in. That the fire was only around her body. It's just weird. Just just that accident. Yeah. In total, there were close to 75 witnesses. And I'm going to save you going through all those 75 witnesses and what they said because everything I've told you so far was what those witnesses had said on the stand. So, okay, we're going to start with Robert Jr.'s testimony because we haven't gone through this. Robert Jr. was Julie's oh, brother. The brother. The brother. Mm-hmm. Okay, sorry. He was doing great on the stand until the defense had their way with him. Robert was asked how long he lived with Julie after their mother died. And Robert said that he moved out shortly after his mom had passed. Then the attorney went in for the kill. Do you remember the time after your marriage that you engaged in sexual bondage with a woman at the Lake of the Ozarks? Robert admitted that, yeah, he had initiated bondage on numerous occasions with at least three different women. And then he also went on to say that they used clothing or tape as bindings to tie himself or his lover up to a bedpost or a chair. And he also admitted to using gags, but not like the type that was used on Julie, just a small piece of tape. The defense came back and said, now I know that there are three girls and I've not named their names and you don't have to name their names either. But I'm going to ask you where all this happened, this bondage occurred. And you don't have to give me an address. And I do know that on one of these occasions, it was at one of their parents' house. But where else did this happen? Julie's brother goes, well, it might have happened 
at White Tree, which is Julie's house, Mm -hmm. the street Julie lived in. And Margulis said, well, Julie lived there during that time period, didn't she? Mm. And Robert said, yep. And Robert's wife was pregnant and sitting in the courtroom. And they looked like she was shocked. They divorced later. I I guess he didn't. This had never come up. No. Okay. Yeah. The next eight witnesses were financial people that basically said that if anything happened to Julie, that Dennis would be the sole benefactor of everything that Julie had, which totaled $725,000 in today's money. They testified that Julie had only named Dennis a beneficiary eight weeks before she was killed, which was two weeks after they were married. But employers from Pricewaterhouse stated that Dennis never told them that he had even married Julie, nor did he include Julie in on any of his company's benefits, and that his mother, Jenny, was still the benefactor. A surprise witness for the prosecution was a teller from Bank On in Chesterfield by Baldwin that said on Monday, March 24th, Dennis drove through the drive-up window Mm -hmm. alone at about 8 a.m. before the bank opened. He wanted to withdraw a large chunk of money. Through the window. Through the window, which he was told he couldn't do because it was a large sum and he had to come into the bank. Mm -hmm. So he had to wait. At 9, when the actual building opened, Dennis approached the teller and asked for a cashier's check for about $60,000. The woman said that there was no balance, that his wife had withdrawn all the money. And then Dennis said, oh, my wife, yeah, she's, she must have done that. Funny enough, this was about the time that uh, Julie's friends from the carpool noticed that what they thought that she had cigarette burns on her face. Mm -hmm. But you know what? She had already said before that she wanted to put acid on her face, so that could be something too, remember? Right before? Yeah. She's like, I'm just so ugly. During the recess, court recess, not, you know, they didn't go out and play on the seesaws or anything. Jenny charmed all the reporters. And she's like, oh, we just loved Julie. We didn't have her very long to love, but we sure did love her. (laughs) Funny thing, a friend of the family said that the books had only met Julie one time. Jenny had actually told the friend that, is he really married to that little girl or is he just pulling my leg? So the defense's star witness was a paid witness. They paid him in today's cash is $13.5,000, which I, that shocks me. I think it's I want to be money. a witness. It's a, it's a, yeah. I want to be a star witness, paid one. I'll start committing crimes and you can witness it oh. and then they'll call you in. Okay. okay. I don't think you get paid for those. But anyway, he was the international authority on erotic deaths. And his name was Dr. Park Dietz. Oh, yeah, Park Dietz. And uh-huh. me. At the time of this trial, he was famous for his testimony as the prosecution's expert witness in the trial of John Hinckley Jr. And for those young folks out there, he was the man that attempted to assassinate Ronald Reagan on March 30th. Because? 1981. Jodie Foster. Love with Jodie Foster and wanted Jodie Foster to recognize and admire him. So he went out and shot the president. Well, that's going to get you. Oh, but it's going to get you a lot of attention. Mm-hmm. But since this trial, he's gone on to do a lot of other, he'd probably charge more now than 13.5. So let's see if you know who uh, else he's been a star witness for or consulted for. Joel Rifkin. Yep. Arthur Shawcross. That would be Rochester, New York. Jeffrey Dahmer. Yep. Una Bomber. Ed. Richard Kukulinski. That is the Iceman. Ah, yeah. The Beltway Sniper Attacks? Yep. And Jared Lee Laffer. I don't know that one. I'm not sure on that one either. We'll have to look it up. Dietz was a consultant to the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Unit, the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crimes. That's a lot to put on a <laughs> sure business is. card. Dr. Dietz was currently studying 150 cases of bondage deaths for the National Institute of Justice. That included, he said, determining whether a death was suicide homicide, or an accident. So the defense asked if there was any risks to tying someone up. And yes, of course, there is. In addition to bruises and cuts, the major risk is death. 250 people die a year, but that number is skewed due to family members who clean up the scene because they don't want their loved ones seen that way. 
the defense asked if Julie's death could have been an accident. The answer was yes, for three reasons. And I'm going to read you those now. Yeah. Number one, it was neat. There is some design to it or that it is not slapped together because it's the visual image that's what matters to them, usually. Two, the bindings on Julie's body were excessive. There was far too much material there that was actually needed to immobilize her. She was only 5'2 and 100 pounds. Come on. Didn't need much to immobilize her. Three, it was all symmetrical and perfectly neat. Even the blue tape was even on both sides. Sexual bondage, the psychiatrist said, in summary, is neat, excessive, and symmetrical. You know what else is? A killer that's done it before. Or a perfectionist. Or she was already dead, and that's why it was so easy to tape her up. Because if you're fighting, it's not going to be symmetrical. If she's... mm -mm. All three of those could also go against, represent a serial killer. They're neat. Mm -hmm. They're, you know... So the first question to Priest, the prosecution, asked was, could it have been murder? Dietz responded, yes, it could have been murder. Then he said, do you think everything Dennis told you was the truth? Because Dietz was the one that actually came in and interviewed And he said, no, even when I assumed that everything he told me was a lie, I still reached the conclusion that it was an accident. And it was all because the gags in the mouth. It's such an unacceptable way to die because most killers don't want to put gags in the mouth, afraid of people biting them. Then it was asked, do you know of any cases where the spouses have engaged in this and the death has occurred? And he said, well, there's only one that I can think of. And he said that it was woman tied up a man, phone rang, and the man suffocated. She went to answer the phone. But that was the only case that he knew. And Julie was the first reported case in America of a wife dying in bondage. Normally it's the man. When Dennis took the stand, he was there for the entire day. And I'm just going to go over a few interesting points that he said happened. So Dennis decided that he was going to break it off with Jody, but he wanted to do it face to face. And he just didn't know when, but he was going to do it. And when he arrived to St. Paul, he was looking through his planner, and he saw that Jody was going to be in St. Louis while he was in Minneapolis. After so he, he just, just left St. Louis. Exactly. Hmm. Who'd have thunk it? Should have checked that date mm-hmm. planner sooner. So he decided he was going to fly back to St. Louis just to break up with her. Right. That night. Mm-hmm. And he used an alias because Julie would check his flight schedule when... Um, He was supposed to be somewhere, and she knew he was there. Yeah. So when he got into St. Louis, he couldn't find Jody at all. You know, they didn't have cell phones, and he called around to all the hotels that he thought she'd stay in. But (laughs) he couldn't find her, and he had nowhere to go, so he went home, which, of course, thrilled Julie. So she opened champagne, and they got drunk and started getting intimate, and then Julie wanted to be bound up snugly in her tape. Because the bondage was part of the marriage package. It was a deal they made when they got married. And that that night, it was only the third time that they had ever participated. Dennis testified, I remember when she introduced me to it. She made the statement, now that you're part of the family, I want to show you something. Margulies asked the client, what was that remark again? He said something like, now that you're part of the family or now that you're in the family? Dennis said that he was so drunk. And after Julie had been taped up, he started to get really dizzy. He got the spins. He was getting nauseated, so he had to run to the bathroom and he started to throw up. He said that he was there for maybe five or more minutes, but it seems like forever when you're sick, doesn't it? Mm. When he felt better, he said he returned to his wife. And she was laying there, so he shook her and she didn't wake up. Dennis did not try to unwrap the tape, thinking there was no time for that. There's no time. Nor... Do you try to cut away the tape? Mm-hmm. It occurred to him to call 911, but he didn't think there was time for that either because he tried to take her pulse and he thought she was dead. And he started throwing a tantrum and pounding on the floor saying, oh, God. And he said he laid there for a while trying to think of what to do. Yeah, he did. And finally, he moved Julie into the garage and then he vacuumed the house twice. Because, that, you know, that totally makes sense. Your spouse is dead. I'm just, you know, no, it, know. it's too late. So I'm just going to move her. It's like weekend at Bernie's. I'm going to move her out to the garage. I'm going to clean the house, do my stuff, do my chores. I don't know. Strange things happen, though. I told you the pantyhose story when I was in that car wreck and I was trapped in the car yeah, and I had to crawl out the window. I can't rip my pantyhose. My last pair. So, yeah, he vacuumed the house twice. 
He straightened up the house. Then he showered. And then he dressed with a suit, pants, tie. So that's what you do. Yeah. And then he said, I just decided I didn't want to live anymore. And so I went into the house. I just needed to be close to her. So I got one of her diaries and read it. I thought somehow that would make me closer to her. But reading the descriptions of her emotional agony that Dennis said he was unaware of. And then he made him mad. He said he flew into a rage and started the fire with the diary. Then he threw the diary in the backseat of Julie Buick, and that ignited the entire garage. Then Dennis's attorney interjected and said, I don't think you understand. You, you're you making a judicial admission to a Class C felony. Do you understand that? <laughs> and Dennis said, yeah. He said when it got too hot, he decided he didn't want to die anymore, so he got out of the house. So during cross-examination, prosecution said, you know, when you realized she was dead, did you consider maybe taking off some of the tape? And he's like, nope, I didn't think about it. Weren't you concerned how Julie would look after she was burned? And he's like, oh, didn't think about it. You really didn't care what she looked like? And he's like, yeah, I didn't think about it. You didn't think about anyone but yourself, did you? They said, and Dennis didn't answer. Isn't it true that you hoped the whole structure would burn and that you would leave her a big piece of charcoal and no one would ever know how she died? Is that what he was, that's, that's what, what the he, prosecution that's said, what he yeah. Was for, and Dennis right? didn't make any response. Then the prosecutor said, after it got too hot for you in the garage, did you ever consider going in and attempting to put out the fire so your wife wouldn't look like she does in this photograph? Dennis said, no. The prosecution to priest pointed out in his closing argument that Dennis had an excuse for every fact and piece of evidence against him because he had spent a year in jail fabricating these lies. But Dennis could never explain away the passport application he picked up in California with his photograph showing him with dyed hair and a beard. Nor the photographs of the house Dennis had taken right before the fire. Yes, Julie had told her doctors she had performed unusual sex acts, but who was she dating? When she answered these questions, Dennis Bullock, he married Julie for her money. He had nothing but a thousand dollars in the bank account and a book of car payments when he walked down the aisle. Defense told the jury that Julie had not been a bad person. She had been a nice person who did not deserve the death she had had. She had been ill and suffered from bizarre delusions. She had told therapists when she was institutionalized that she had indulged in unusual sexual behavior. Julie's brother, he said, he had testified to sexual bondage with tapes and gags over the past four to five years. He told you that he lived with Julie for some period of time. And then when Julie and Dennis get married, she introduces the bondage to Dennis the first time. And she says, you're one of the family now. I think you can use your logic to figure out where she found out about bondage from. That was his way to get what Terry had said in there without having to say Terry was in it. The case of State of Missouri versus Dennis Neal Bullock went to jury at 740 on the morning of June 3rd, 1987. Reporters, court watchers, everybody stuck around. It was a huge case. It was huge. The, you couldn't get it. You had to stand in line three hours before court started to even try to get a seat there. Mm -hmm. And then the same once it broke for lunch. Did yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So everybody assumed that the jury would reach its verdict by one o'clock in the morning tops, he'd be sentenced just in time for the local news. Mm -hmm. Sentenced to death, by the way. Mm -hmm. Six hours went by, and at 5.40 p.m., the jury sent a message to the judge saying they had reached the final verdict, and the room went quiet. Mm -hmm. The clerk opened up the verdict and read it aloud and said, We, the jury, find the defendant, Dennis Neal Bullock, guilty of involuntary manslaughter. No. What? Yep. Everybody was shocked, so they had to read it twice. And then somebody in the courtroom was heard to say, well, they may be a jury of Dennis Bullock's peers, but thank God they're not a peer of mine. Really? Mm -hmm. He was sentenced to a maximum of seven years in prison. For everybody was pissed wife. for the death of his wife. It was all an accident. That was his defense. So everybody was upset. When questioned, the foreman, Larry said a majority of jurors, 11 of them, had found Dennis guilty of murder in the first degree. 
on the early ballots that they took. Mm -hmm. But jury decisions in criminal cases must be unanimous. Mm -hmm. Larry kept pushing for first degree murder, but one juror said he would deadlock the jury until they agreed with him. He had lost two wives and he felt that Dennis had suffered enough. He did not believe in the whole eye for an eye thing, which, you know. Maybe they should have looked into that juror. Maybe well, they he did. His wife. Well, you know. Got two of them. He did, but everybody thought that he just didn't believe in the death penalty. But even though during jury selections, he was given an oath that he was not opposed to it. Mm -hmm. Larry also said that the juror told him one time he was a witness on a trial and the lawyer put him on the spot. Larry, the jury foreman, said that this juror had been very inattentive during the discussion, and he didn't quite understand the jury's role in a case. He kept asking why the jury just couldn't make Dennis a deal. The prosecution can make him a deal, but why can't juries? I know. I know. I, don't look at me like that. I know. Uh, I know. I don't even know what to say. I know. Larry said he kept trying to explain it, but this juror kept rambling on, and he wouldn't Almost do like anything. He's not. And then, you know, he accused the prosecution of badgering Dennis, and it wasn't right. So finally, the 11 jurors, for some reason, just gave in to this man, and they went to involuntary manslaughter. So Larry said that he thought the juror was too biased and shouldn't have been on the jury at all. But he thought, without a doubt, Dennis should have gotten the death sentence. The tape that was put neatly there, Dennis was drunk. There's no way he could have done it, he said. And he also said that he felt that Dennis was lying to everybody, his wife, his employers, his girlfriend, and he lied to us while he was on the stand, is what he said. So Anne, the ex-wife, she didn't believe Dennis had killed Julie for the money. Not totally. That wouldn't have been enough for Dennis. He killed Julie over his loss of control of her and the loss of control of the money. I believe that. I'd say it's a little bit of both. The money he could invest and turn himself into a real estate tycoon. Or a stock investor. A friend of Julie's said that they couldn't believe that this little prim, professional little Julie had been made into the whore of Babylon because that girl didn't even truly know how to flirt. She kept her reserved facade of little navy blue suit, little closed toed pumps, little bow tie, total working girl from 1980. Oh, totally. Movie, right? I was just thinking that. Yeah. There was no sensual aromas, no sexual vibes, no aura. She didn't want anyone to take her wrong. All she ever wanted was to make a life with a partner and have a family. Her goals were good, red-blooded American goals. The public was pissed and was outraged about the verdict. That's nothing. Mm -mm. Seven years? Nope. And he did it. Everybody knew he did it. Well, he admitted he did it, right? Well, he admitted he set fire. Yeah. But he said it was an accident. Dennis started getting death threats, and actually the prosecuting attorney stopped opening his mail because... He was getting so many hate letters. So about a month or so later, DePriest, the prosecutor, ran into that juror, the holdout, and he said, Hey, how could you didn't put all that evidence I read about in the post-dispatch? Why didn't you put that in the trial? He said, I'd have voted for Berger if you'd have put that. Dennis was released on $50,000 bond until July. So when he was sentenced on July 10th, he was sentenced to seven years in prison and a $5,000 fine. And then after he was hauled out in his handcuffs, Jenny, his mom, turned to the media and said, this is all your fault, to one reporter. Mm -hmm. The media has turned this into a circus, the reporter said under the breath. Lady, I've been at this 10 years and I've never seen anything like this. Your son did it. We didn't. I agree. Uh -huh. So in Missouri, when a defendant is tried on a capital crime, like murder in the first degree, he or she cannot be tried for lesser crimes at the same trial. So I did not know that. Yes. So St. Louis County prosecuting attorney, you'll remember this name, George Buzz Westfall. Oh, Buzz Westfall. Mm -hmm. Yep. Announced that Dennis would face additional charges. If he, he wouldn't but it have, can't be murder or anything. It can't be know. murder. If they would have gone for involuntary manslaughter, maybe they could have put the other charges on. But since they went for first degree, they couldn't mm -hmm. put the other charges on. Mm -hmm. So 15 days after the verdict, June 18th, Westfall asked the prosecuting attorney, DePriest, to issue two more warrants against Dennis. He was charged with tampering with evidence, which was burning Julie's diary and other stuff. 
and also charged with armed criminal action, which was using a a weapon to commit a felony. In this case, it would have been the tape that suffocated Julie. So on the 25th, the St. Louis County Grand Jury indicted Dennis on these charges. Good. I hope they give him the death penalty for those charges, but Mm -hmm. I bet they don't. And then on September 11th, the grand jury indicted Dennis for second-degree arson for burning the garage. First-degree arson is basically knowingly starting a fire that endangers a human. Second-degree is knowingly damaging property. Yeah, he didn't knowingly hurt anyone because she was already dead. Mm -hmm. So Dennis was rearrested on June 18th because of the indictment, and his bond was set at $300,000 which the Bullocks couldn't raise the funds for. So Dennis had to keep his little white butt in jail. Good. So Dennis's attorney said, you know what? I think Westfall is being vindictive. And also the president of the American Civil Liberties Union of Eastern Missouri said the new charges raised the specter of double jeopardy, which is trying to defend it twice for the same crime. And that's prohibited by your Fifth Amendment. So also, under the statute of providing that a criminal cannot profit from his or her crimes, Westfall froze Dennis's inheritance from Julie's estates. Investigators seized $75,000 in cash, $50,000 in jewelry, and this was all in Mm -hmm. 86 money. Mm -hmm. Insurance companies sued Dennis so they wouldn't have to pay her death benefits. And Julie's brother sued Dennis for the return of his sister's property, which I don't think he ever got. Dennis's trial for arson and tampering with evidence and possibly armed criminal action was scheduled to be sometime in July 1988, and they moved the trial to Cape Girardeau, which is about 200 miles south of St. Louis, because they wanted to escape, because it was a very well-known case. Mm -hmm. Dennis was well-known. So that trial, the jury found him guilty as charged. He was guilty of tampering with evidence and second-degree arson in the fire, he said, on May 6th. 1986 to cover up the killing of his wife. Dennis's lawyer appealed the armed criminal action charge, saying that it was double jeopardy, and everybody agreed with him. They did not charge him on that. The jury recommended that Dennis be sentenced to 11 years in prison, and the jury agreed. So Dennis was taken to the Maximum Security Penitentiary in Missouri, which is in Jefferson City, and it's known to be Missouri's toughest prison. Good. And Dennis stayed there. He also got the name Sparky. Sparky. Don't know why. And supposedly some inmates had their little old eyes on Sparky. Mm -hmm. Well, good. I'm glad he's in prison. I've been there. It's creepy. And he's right where he needs to be. Although he needs to be in there for life. But okay. For longer. But on February 13th, 1990, a panel of three appellate judges reversed Dennis's arsoning and tampering convictions. Why? And ordered a new trial. Which would be his third time in court and his third Arson trial. Why? Well, it seemed that in his rebuttal with closing arguments in the first arson trial, prosecutor Tom Meehan had referred to the fact that Dennis had not testified, and that violated the defendant's Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Sometimes the things, the technicalities that ruin trials, and it's shocking to me. So Dennis would be free on bond. He's free again? On bond, awaiting for his third trial. He was eligible for parole from his first conviction for involuntary manslaughter on the death of Julie. So he got seven years, and in two, what was that, two years or so, he's eligible for parole? Mm Mm-hmm. I need to run the world. That's it. I know. So Dennis had served four years of his seven-year sentence for manslaughter, which included one year in jail before his murder. So they let him out on bond. The afternoon of June 1990, Dennis wheeled a grocery cart filled with his television set and other belongings through the doors of the state penitentiary where he was met by his mom and dad and his grandma. So he's out already. Well, he was on bond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had let Jenny and Bob and Graham had listed their house as collateral to make Dennis's $150,000 bond. So spotting Dennis was a game that summer, and Dennis loved the attention He suffered from uh, delusions of grandeur, I guess. One guy said, oh, he thinks he's just a huge celebrity. Infamous, not famous. So he returned to Arnold for the first time in four years to live with his parents. Shortly after that, he was reindicted. Good. Is he gone? His tampering with evidence charge now included his 
burning of Julie's body along with her diary. The prosecutors reasoned that because her remains were so charred, it was impossible to tell whether Julie had fought against being tied and gagged. Margulies, Dennis's attorney, wanted his client to plead guilty, since Dennis had admitted that he set fire during he the murder did. charge. But Westfall said that Dennis would be retried for arson unless he pleaded guilty and accepted a sentence totaling 10 years. And you know what? 10 years was just too much time for the defense to accept. Which is really five years. At, well, at most. So the morning of his third trial, August 28th, 1990, Dennis stood outside the courthouse in Columbia. And a television reporter said after interviewing Dennis that, you know, I look him in the eye and there's something missing. Just a piece missing. This guy showed no remorse at all. Nothing for his wife. Only for himself. I had expected a bizarre madman. Instead, all he was was your run-of-the-mill psychopath. He's just ordinary. And then the opening statements, John Ross introduced the photographs of Julie's house that Dennis had taken and dropped off on May 5th, right before she was found dead. And the pictures, he said, showed that Dennis wanted to record insurance purposes. You know, that's why he did it. And they also illustrated that Dennis intended to burn the house and the garage. So not only was Dennis mm -hmm. planning to murder his wife and destroy the evidence, he was also plotting to file a fraudulent insurance claim. That's exactly claim. right. That's, uh, he thought the whole house would go up. Mm -hmm. Ignoring his attorney's advice, Dennis took the stand. Of course he did. Because he wanted to set the record because straight, he's he a said. Narcissist. The prosecution asked him, is it true that you tell whatever story is necessary at the time to serve your purpose? And Dennis says, are you calling me a liar? <laughs> And the prosecution said, are you a liar? Dennis said, no. Prosecutor says, how would you define a liar? Dennis, somebody who doesn't tell the truth. And the prosecutor says, okay. Let's go back through the investigation and determine and if, in fact, Mr. Bullock, if you are a liar. So let's start when you flew to St. Louis to Minneapolis. You didn't use your name, is that right? Bam. And then he did more. He's like, okay, so asking Jim to lie for you giving false suspects, saying Julie committed suicide. And Dennis tried to excuse it all. I was in a panic. I thought I caused her death. Blah, 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 blah. So Ross asked a series of questions about the burning of Julie's body. And when he did, he presented Dennis with blow-up photographs of Julie burnt to a crisp in her chair. And Dennis averted his head and said, oh, I don't really want to see that. Please don't let me see that. So then Ross showed Dennis, the little list of questions that he had wrote out during all those phone calls, he admitted that those were his. And uh, Ross asked about the one in particular that asked Ed if he knows anyone to locate a new ID. And then Ross pointed out that Dennis was trying to create a new identity. But he's not a liar. And Dennis retorted, at that time, when I was really panicked and confused, that was my intent. But after I settled down and cleared my head, I changed my mind. Over and over, Dennis repeated that he only was on the run because he thought he had killed his wife in the fire. Finally, he admitted that the burning of Julie's body eliminated any trace of defensive wounds and fingerprints. That meant he had destroyed evidence of the killing. But he persisted in saying that he did not mean to do so. Then Ross quoted Dennis's testimony from the first trial in which he said that reading his wife's diary caused him anger and pain. Ross said, I assumed that's because she was saying things about you so clearly in the diary that it could have been evidence. And Dennis kind of smiled, said that actually she was saying things about herself and her brother. And Ross said, well, if it was true, why didn't you tell your attorney? He could have used that in cross-examination with Robert Jr. So Ross had a little trick up his sleeve with Dennis. This was the question. Dennis? Why, during your first trial, did you order seven color photographs of your wife still strapped in her rocking chair lying on the morgue table before the autopsy began? And that was in addition to demanding multiple copies of other pictures of Julie's charred remains. Margulies never requested them. <gasps> what bizarre purpose did you have in mind, especially now when you can't bear to look at the pictures? And then when Ross brought out the photographs of Julie after the fire and flashed them just right in front of Dennis's face, Dennis protested and said he didn't want to look at them and turn his head. And he said, 
You've seen these several times already. Why does it bother you now? Dennis didn't respond. He was furious. And later, Ross said, I thought it was going to hit me. (laughs) So it only took the jury 90 minutes to find him guilty on all counts. Thank you. They recommended the maximum sentence of seven years on the arson charge and five years on tampering with evidence. Not enough. Total of 12 years in prison. So, which with overcrowding meant Dennis, who was currently out on parole, would have to go back, spend another four or five years in prison before becoming eligible for parole again sometime within 1995-98. Not enough time. Mm -mm. So, of course, Dennis blamed his attorney, you know, the one that had saved his life. Somebody else's fault. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. The jury foreman told reporters that Dennis's biggest mistake was that he testified. And then when they interviewed Dennis's attorney, he was embarrassed. And he said, never before have I had a client so out of control in what he said and how he acted. Classic. So while awaiting, he was still out. He hadn't had to go to prison yet. He was awaiting his October 9th sentencing. He took a job making real estate referrals by phone. He also began dating a woman in her early 30s who had an affluent father. Didn't see that coming. She was said to be pretty cute, too. So in addition to dating, Dennis regularly attended church in Arnold, where one fellow parishioner said he's heavy into the Bible, going to Bible classes and everything. Some members are behind him. Some are upset. Dennis shows no remorse what he did to his wife. He had no remorse for his parents who have ruined themselves financially over him. He shows none of the emotions most people would show. Dennis was then sentenced on October 9th to five years for tampering and seven years for arson, running concurrently for a total of 12 years. However, the judge allowed Dennis to remain out on his $150,000 bond, depending his appeal for a new trial. Are you kidding me? No. (laughs) Hello, this is why it's so long. Dennis was sent back to jail in 1992 to serve out a seven-year sentence. But the Missouri Court of Appeals accelerated his release, saying all of his sentences should have been served concurrently. So they moved up his release date and then added time for good behavior, and Dennis was released on January of 1993. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So one Sunday night in June 1996, a woman and her friend returned home to her apartment in Columbia, Illinois. They had found a man inside the apartment. She called the police. The man who was in her apartment without her permission was Dennis Bullock, an ex-boyfriend and ex-convict. They took him away, and she was going to prosecute him, but then dropped the prosecution. The woman dropped the charges and moved away because Hmm. she told the police that she was afraid of him. But while there was no charges, he was still on parole. So he was put on house arrest and had to wear an ankle bracelet. Everybody has their own different theories and what happened. One police officer thinks Dennis's all-known acts of violence were all against women in bed and during sex. And he thinks taping and gagging a woman until she was totally under his control was his turn on. And while Dennis testified that Julie had tied him up, no one other partner had actually said that Dennis had ever been bound. They think that him tying somebody else up was his big kink. And with time, Dennis needed more and more perversions to get aroused and thought that maybe while Julie was dying, he was pleasuring himself. And the struggles and the muffled yelling probably heightened his pleasure. Because it was clearly there's no way Dennis could ever have any kind of sex with Julie when she was bound like that and in that chair. So he did it. I know he did it. I mean, I guess and it could have been an accident, plan- but I think it was planned. Why would he fly home? Mm. He got mad and flew home. I think he killed her first and then thought, okay, great. How am I going to make this look like an accident? Well, okay. I don't know, but if she took the money out or he found out she took the money out on the end of March. So he had an entire month to think about it. Mm. I think she told him on the phone that she was going to divorce him and he got mad and he had been planning it all along. And he thought, well, shit, I better go now. He probably called her. She was telling him she was going to get a divorce. He didn't deposit that check. Mm -hmm. She took all of his clothes out. And she said, I already took your shit out of the house Mm -hmm. and you've got to leave. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I got to do this now. And he didn't. It's not an accident. mm -mm. Nope. 
So actually one of another person said, you know what, that this case had nothing to do with sex. It was Mm-mm. all about murder. I think he killed and, her first and then thought, how can I make this look? Hey, you know, my other girlfriend say I was in the bondage. We'll pretend she is, you know, mm-hmm. sort of like when you feel really guilty, like say if there's a spouse and they're cheating on you, they are cheating on mm-hmm. you. And so then they start putting it on you. Are you cheating on me? I know you're, and they get so obsessive because they're doing it. And I think that's what he was like, yeah. okay, I can make, I can make this look like we did this together. We, we were in the bondage. Yeah. And- I think he came home pissed, beat her up, tied her up, burned her and to hide the evidence. Mm-hmm. And that whole sex stuff was a ruse, just totally like a and red I herring think- to throw everybody off. And I think he thought that the whole house would go up. Mm-hmm. And it would be like he could get insurance. Yep. And somebody broke in there and did that because he was in St. Paul. Mm -hmm. Whatever. So I want to give a big kudos to Ellen Harris. She's the woman that wrote the book Dying to Get Married, The Courtship and Murder of Julie Miller Bullock. There are no transcripts available of the court documents. And I don't know if it's under wraps because of the socialite. I don't know what's going on. I couldn't find it. But Ellen sat at the trial the entire time and she wrote the book on that. So all the information I got, well, not all, because I did get it a lot from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch newspapers, but there's a lot of information like of the court proceedings that weren't in the newspapers that I had to get out of Ellen's book. So big thank you to her. If you want to read it, it's available at Amazon. I know it's available on Kindle. It's still in print. Go read it. It's fascinating. There's more to it, believe it or not. Yeah. But yeah, Ellen is used to be a TV producer where she won Emmy Awards. Pretty fascinating. She now works at Washington as an instructor for African American studies. Yeah. So that's it. Sorry it took so long. That was fascinating, Jen. Good Amazing, work. huh? Lots of legwork on that one. I'm tired. I'm sorry, Nico. Sorry, Nico. <laughs> we love you, Nico. Poor Nico. We want to thank. We want to thank Nico. He put up with some crap that I'm, he normally does with us, but he really knocked it out of the ballpark for us. So we, he is excellent and oh so accommodating. So if you need an editor or music or check anything, out Nico. check him out. Believe me, we are going to canonize him. We feel he is a saint. Really, he really is. He's so awesome. Check him out at we talk of dreams dot com. Mm-hmm. All right, Jen. So remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, Bye-bye. Love you. Before he left the point. <laughs> you're probably thinking about what you need to do like three hours from now, so you're not, you know, your nails. Are good, though. Mm-hmm. Don't look too close. A neighbor, neighbor, the prosecution hypothesized. I said that on the first oh, word. I did it. Woohoo, go me. Um, the Gerald. Jared. Jared. Okay. He went to Jared. Okay. So. Oh, wait, is that Jared from Subway? (laughs) I bet it is. I don't think so. Uh Uh-uh. Wait, what's his name? Jared Lee. Okay, keep going. Now that's Jared. Yeah. (laughs) Hold on, honey. (laughs) She goes with a leather mask that, you know, you zip up. Can Mm -hmm. you breathe through those? I don't know. I've never worn one. Sure. I don't know what you're talking about, Camille. Pretend like you don't know. Okay. In the second trial. 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 Julie's Julie's jewelry and her jewelry and